side? Joy, peace of life, 
of salvation, those things found in the person, the life, the death, the resurrection, the work of Jesus. Um, so this last week, our elementary age kids um, went to kids camp, and so had a, had a great couple days in Hidden Falls Ranch with them. They braved 100 plus weather and learned about the armor of God and had a great time together. Grateful for all of our sponsors and students who went out with them. Four other churches that joined us as well. So we had roughly 100 folks out there. Um, speaking again of kids, next Sunday we will promote. Um, and so if you have a kid that's in the transition, so we have a, a three and four year old class that they're moving into the five and six. If you have a five and six year old that's got a one going to be starting first grade and moving up, or a third grader who's moving into the older class, all that's happening next week. Devaney has been working to make sure you have that information. If you have questions about that, you can grab her after the service, um, or you can grab me. Um, we just want to make sure that you know all of those transitions are going to be happening next week, um, and then, then the weeks to come they'll be in their new, their new class. So this morning, um, kids kindergarten down have child care um, after our second song before the sermon down this hallway. Um, and our elementary age kids have class every other week. So this week you do have class. And so you'll line up by the front door. Um, and then last thing. So um, several weeks ago, we got to pray for um, Russ and Susan and their team as they headed um, out to, to Mexico. We want to do that whenever we have groups headed out. And then the week following that, we in, in the um, early service, we prayed for John Milligan as he headed out um, to Austin as a graduated senior who's going to school down there. Um, and so what we've been trying to do is the, the last Sunday one of our seniors is here is just praying over them and their family, um, knowing that it is an emotional time, that it is a convoluted time right, of, of joy and celebration and accomplishment, and also there's just a change of season, and, and with that can be some grief. Um, and so want to, to make sure you know who those seniors are as you're praying for them. And so this morning, um, Kaylee Ballou, I'm going to have you come up. Um, to your mom and dad, you're going to pray over the Ballou family as Kaylee heads off to WT this week. And so obviously those of you who have sent kiddos off to school, um, you can put yourself in the position of siblings, mom, and dad. Um, you've been the one that's gone off. It's just a transition in life. So we just want to pray over Kaylee, you and your family. Um, so if you'll join me in prayer. Father, what a gift family is. And Lord, we thank you for Kaylee. We thank you um, for her desire to honor you. Um, we thank you for her family um, who has supported her, who has encouraged her, who has um, walked and guided her over the last 18 years. And so, Father, would you minister to hearts, um, to minds this week, um, where we ask that you would provide godly friends for Kaylee. We ask that you would provide um, a church family in Canyon. Father, we ask that you would be a balm to John and Kelly and their families' hearts as they adjust to what a new normal looks like? And would they all know that they are loved, supported, prayed for, not just in this moment, but in the days and weeks to come by this church family? Lord, that they would be um, anchored in your grace, your kindness, and your mercy. Um, Lord, we love you. We're asking for your face to shine upon the doors. In Jesus' name.
God will send out his steadfast love and his faithfulness. My soul is in the midst of lions. I lie down amid fiery beasts. The children of man, whose teeth are spears and arrows, whose tongues are sharp swords. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. Let's worship. <laughs>
Lord, we come to you this morning so grateful for your kindness to us. Um, Lord, it is a mystery of mysteries and a miracle of all miracles that you would speak to us through your word. Uh, God, that this book that was written so long ago, um, penned by hands that we will never meet on this side of heaven, uh, can convict and encourage and prick our hearts because of your spirit at work in this room this morning. Uh, would we be encouraged today that you are a living God who speaks to his people, whose desire is that we might know you more deeply, uh, whose desire is that we might see you as beautiful, and that our sin might be convicted, that we might bring it to you in confession, turn our hearts to you, and follow you wholeheartedly this week. So by your word, would you speak, um, would you encourage, would you bring hope and conviction and meet each person? each child of yours in this room today where we need to be met as you know it best in jesus name amen you guys can have a seat our littlest friends are dismissed on this hallway for child care that's kindergarten and down our first two fifth graders can be miss ryan at the door to head down the road for your class Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 11. 
Jeremiah writes this, This whole land shall become a ruin and a waste, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon seventy years. Then after seventy years are completed, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, the land of the Chaldeans, for their iniquity, declares the Lord, making the land an everlasting waste. And then if you turn over just a couple of chapters to Jeremiah 29 and verse 10. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. So here's what Daniel, he's walking through, studying, reading Jeremiah. And, and he's all of a sudden going, wait a second, God has promised that after 70 years, he's going to take us back. And it's a twofold promise. The first being that Babylon will be removed, right? That they will be overthrown. And so here he is in the first year of the reign of the, the Medes and the Persians going, God, you kept your word. Right? Like the Babylon has been overthrown. It's been 66 years, which is right, really close to 70. And so here he is going, God, you have done what you said you would do with the Babylonians. I want the other piece of the promise. I want you to restore us to where we belong, to our land. Because remember, as a child, when he is ripped out of Israel, he has seen Jerusalem sacked, the, the temple has been destroyed, and so he is longing, right, to see God restore the Jews back to Israel. All right, so let's, let's pick up and see his response now as he just perceives this in Jeremiah. So verse 3. Then I turned my face to the Lord, God, seeking him by prayer and pleas for mercy with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed to the Lord my God, and I made confession, saying, O Lord, the great and awesome God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. We have sinned and done wrong and acted wickedly and rebelled, turning aside from your commandments and rules. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. To you, O Lord, belongs righteousness, but to us, open shame. As at this day, to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and to all of Israel, those who are near and those who are far away, in all the lands which you have driven them because of the treachery they have committed against you. To us, O Lord, belongs open shame, to our kings, to our princes, and to our fathers, because we've sinned against you. To the Lord, our God, belong mercy and forgiveness, for we have rebelled against him. And we have not obeyed the voice of the Lord, our God, by walking in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. All Israel has transgressed your law and turned aside, refusing to obey your voice, and the curse and oath that are written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, has been poured out upon us because we have sinned against him. He has confirmed his words, which he spoke against us and against our rulers who ruled us by bringing upon us a great calamity. For under the whole heaven, there has not been done anything like what has been done against Jerusalem. And as it's written in the law of Moses, all of this calamity has come upon us. Yet we have not entreated the favor of the Lord our God, turning from our iniquities and gaining insight by your truth. Therefore the Lord has kept ready the calamity and has brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all the works that he has done, and we have not obeyed his voice. And now, O Lord, our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and have made a name for yourselves, as at this day we have sinned and we have done wickedly. O oh Lord, according to all your righteous acts, let your anger and your wrath turn away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy hill, because of our sins. And for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people have become a byword among all who are around us. Now therefore, O oh our God, listen to the prayer of your servant, to his pleas for mercy and for your own sake, O oh Lord. Make your face to shine upon your sanctuary, which is desolate. Oh, God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations and the city that is called by your name. For we do not present our pleas before you because of our righteousness, but 
because of your great mercy. Oh Lord, hear. Oh Lord, forgive. Oh Lord, pay attention and act. Delay not for your own sake. Oh my God. Because your city and your people are called by your name. So we have this long, beautiful, powerful prayer from Daniel. Remember that in Daniel chapter 6, right, he is found in his room, in his home, praying three times a day through an open window, looking at Jerusalem, right, because they knew his, his rhythm, that he was faithful to do this. We saw in Daniel chapter 2, right, that when he needs to interpret Nebuchadnezzar's dream, that he prays, asking God for interpretation. And then when God gives it, he immediately prays, thanking him for the interpretation. That Daniel is a praying individual. And here we have him, right, having seen the Lord speak through Scripture. He now is turning his face. You can picture him in his room praying. But it says in verse 3 that he is fasting right from food. He's wearing sackcloth and ashes. This sackcloth, this rough, rough cloth, right, symbolic of repentance. Ashes, right, symbolic of of, of grief, of ruin. And so he is lamenting, saying, God, we want to be back where we belong. And he's not just praying that, he is visibly lamenting by marking his body with clothing, with lack of food, with ash, saying, God, we long for you to keep the other half of this promise, not just as Babylon been overthrown, but that we would be restored to Jerusalem. And so it's a prayer of praise, it's a prayer of confession, and it's a prayer of a petition. He asks at the end. But I want us to notice a few things. Look, he says, right as he's praying, look at verse 5. He says, we have sinned. It would be easy here to imagine, right, Daniel saying, they have sinned. Right here he is ripped out of his home as a teenager. Taken, and he has been faithful before King Nebuchadnezzar. In the midst of a pagan place, he has honored the Lord for nearly 70 years. It would be easy to go, hey God, they did this. Our leaders did this. Our rulers did this. Those people did this. My, my, our ancestors, like I didn't do it. And yet, what does he say? We have sinned. He is owning, right, that, that God has set a standard that we have fallen short of, Daniel included. That we, we don't always trust the Lord. We don't always follow Him. We don't always delight in Him or desire Him. And we create things in our life, idols, that we want more than Him. Daniel's not excluding himself. He's saying, God, we have done this. And I want you to, to listen to how he talks about himself and his people. Beginning in verse 5, he says, We have sinned. We have done wrong. We have acted wickedly. And rebel, we have turned to the side from your commandments and your rules, saying, God, you set up an expectation, and we haven't met it. You have a relationship and a standard for us, and we have failed to keep it. Verse 7, he says, right to you belongs righteousness to us, open shame. Why? Look at the end of verse 7. Because of the treachery that they have committed against you. Um, verse 8 to you, O oh Lord, to us, O oh Lord, belongs open shame. Why? Because we have sinned against you. Go down to verse 15. He says, And now, O oh Lord, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt, we have sinned. We have done wickedly. He is simply just saying, like, consistently, God, we are confessing our sin that we have fallen short. He continues. Go to verse 6. We haven't listened to your servants, the prophets. Who spoke to our kings, our princes, our fathers, and to all the people of the land. He says, listen, you spoke to us through your word. You gave us servants, your prophets, to guide us, to give interpretation, to help us understand. They spoke to our leaders. They didn't listen. But they also spoke to the whole nation. And we didn't listen. So it's not just that we've sinned. You asked us to trust your word. We haven't done it. He continues then. In verse 7 and 8, twice he says... We have open shame. God, you are holy and you are righteous, and yet we walk around in shame because of our sin, because of our rebellion. Verse 9. 
we have rebelled against him. Like, so he's extolling all the virtue of God, the attributes and the character, and then saying, but we've sinned, and we haven't listened, and we've, we've been wicked, and we, have, we're carry, we carry our shame because of it, because we've rebelled against you, God. And then in verse 10, we have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God by walking in his laws. Again, he says, you set them before us by your servants, the prophets. Verse 11, all of Israel has transgressed your law and turned aside, refusing to obey your voice. And then verse 14, right? We have not obeyed his voice. So basically, Daniel's just saying, God, we, not, like, we haven't done what you've asked. And you gave us every opportunity. You gave us your word. You gave us your prophets. You gave us your voice. You gave us a standard. You gave us an expectation. And we have failed completely and entirely. And then he begins to just in, intermittently in this, he talks about God. Look at verse 4. As he's praying to the Lord, he says, My God. Like, you, you're mine. I say, Lord, you are great and awesome. You keep your covenant and your steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. So verse 4, he's saying, God, I'm coming to you because you're the source of what we need. You are steadfast and you are faithful. You have done all that we need. And we have rebelled against you. And so he is once again reminded, he's saying, you are great, and you are awesome. You keep your covenant, and you're steadfast. If we go to verse 15, right, what is he referring to with steadfast? He's referring to the fact that God pulls his people out of Egypt, and at Mount Sinai, he tells them, listen, you're not going to you're not gonna do what I ask. You're, you're not. But my love is steadfast. You are attached to me. And it's not your ability to hold on to me. It is going to be my ability to hold on to you. It is, I'm going to keep the covenant because you won't. And Daniel is admitting, we haven't. You are great. You are awesome. You are steadfast. And you keep the covenant. You have been faithful. So, down to now, he says, listen, verse 9. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness. Earlier in verse 7, he says, you belong to righteousness. He's like, you are the source of the things we need. We need righteousness, you have it. We need mercy, you have it. We need forgiveness, you have it. We are coming to the one who we have sinned against, but asking him to give us what we desperately need in righteousness and mercy and forgiveness. And then you'll notice, it's beginning in verse 10 through 14, he just starts to say, listen, a calamity has befallen us. Like, this is horrible. Your temple's been destroyed. Jerusalem's been ransacked. But God, you've done it, and you said you would do it. Right? You've kept your word. Look at verse 11. All of Israel has transgressed your law and turned aside, refusing to obey your voice. And the curse and the oath that are written in the law of Moses has been poured out upon us because we've sinned against him. In Deuteronomy 28, there's this, God is talking to his people. He says, listen, if you obey me, here are the benefits and the blessings that will come. And if you turn to other gods, eventually enemies are going to come in and take you out. And you're going to be removed from your land. And he's saying, God, that's happened. You told us it would happen. You told us it would. And here we are living in it. So he's not raising an angry fist at God saying, I can't believe we're here. He's saying, you told us this would happen. You have been faithful. You have kept your word. And because of that, we're coming back asking you to be gracious and merciful once again. And so ultimately, we get down to verse 16 where he begins to ask the Lord. So he's told the Lord, I do know who you are. Here are the things about you. Here's our sin. Look at verse 16. O Lord, according to your righteous acts, let your anger and your wrath turn away from the city of Jerusalem, your holy hill, because of our sins, for the iniquities of our fathers. Right? He's saying, would you please turn it away from them? Quit pouring out calamity and wrath upon them. Why? Because your name is great. We're attached to you. We're 
attached to you. Right? And it's not, we have, we have not kept our end of the bargain. Listen, let's look at verse 17. So God, listen to the prayer of your servant, to my pleas for mercy. Why? For your sake, Lord. Make your face to shine upon your sanctuary, which is desolate. He's saying this. Like, because we're attached to you, and we're not where we belong, and the temple's been destroyed, and all these things have taken place. He said, we need you, for your name's sake, to show that you are so powerful and mighty. Listen, Israel was not an impressive nation. But because God had rescued them and made them his people, he was, right, it was like an exhibit for the world to see his power, his might, his kindness, his mercy, his goodness. They're now being punished. Right? They're, they're being disciplined. And so they're saying, listen, God, for your name to be great again, for people to see it, to, to extol it, would you restore your temple and your city and your people? Not for our good, but for, for your good. That your face would shine upon the sanctuary. And so, listen, in verse 18, he says, not because of our righteousness. Like saying, we can't make you do it. We don't deserve it. But why? Because of your great mercy. So verse 19, he says, So Lord, act. Hear. Forgive. Pay attention. Act. Please don't delay. Please do this so that your name will be known and trusted and renowned across the world. And so this is the prayer that Daniel is, is like praying. We're going to pick up now in verse 20. Because he's going to get an immediate answer to this prayer. While I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, presenting my plea before the Lord my God for the holy hill of my God. While I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the first, came to me in swift flight at the time of the evening sacrifice. He made me understand, speaking with me and saying, Oh, Daniel, I've now come out to give you insight and understanding. At the beginning of your pleas for mercy, a word went out, and I've come to tell it to you. For you are greatly loved. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. Seventy weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and prophet, and to anoint a most holy place. Know, therefore, and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one, a prince, there shall be seven weeks. And then for sixty-two weeks it shall be built again with squares and moat, but in a troubled time. And after the sixty-two weeks an anointed one shall be cut off and have nothing. And the people of the prince who, who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and its end will come with a flood, and to the end there shall be war. Desolations are decreed, and he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week, and for half of the week he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering, and on the wing of abomination shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolate. And in chapter 9, we see Daniel both the clear, beautiful prayer, and then what? Right? Like, what is taking place here in these last 24 through 27? Like, it's, it's convoluted, and it's confusing. And so, we, while Daniel is praying, you'll remember in chapter 8, Gabriel was the one who brought the interpretation of his second vision. So he recognizes Gabriel here, the angel. Right, he's praying, and Gabriel comes and says, I'm looking to help you understand that God is answering your prayer, but it's going to look different than you anticipated. He says, because you're loved, Daniel. Now listen, verses 24 through 27 is one of the most contested, disagreed upon portions of Scripture that there is. Right, This is a place where people pull out charts and graphs and history books. And look to make you understand like, like where all these things fit into history. But the issue is this, is that apocalyptic literature isn't allegory. It's not looking for you to find all the nuance and specific detail. It is looking to paint a bigger, broader picture. It is, it is more symbolic in nature. 
And so in verse 24, when it says 70 weeks, the, the translation is really it's 70 sevens, right? 70 sevens. And so people want to say, okay, it's 490 years, because it's talking about years. So, and then they start to want to find in history 490 and to work through, okay, the first seven, and then the next 62, and then the last, like, but it's symbolic. Remember in Matthew, when um, Peter is asked, how many times should I forgive? What does he say? What does Jesus tell him? To forgive 70 times seven, 490. What is Jesus not saying? He's not saying, hey, keep a chart. The tally marks. And when they hit 490, you forgive them. And when they hit 491, you're done. That's not what he's saying, right? He's, he's given a number of completion. A number of, like, like, there is a plan, there is completion, right? It's not saying, listen, um, Carmen, you have sinned. This was 281 this morning. And we got some years to go. Right? So let's slow, the, let's slow this down because I don't know if we're going to make it to the end. Right? Like that, that is not the intent at all. And so we understand that when it comes to Peter and Jesus telling him that in Matthew about forgiveness. And then we come to here and we're like 490 years and we want to pull off and go, okay, fit it all into history where he is simply saying there is a completion to what is taking place here. That there's, we don't want to miss the hope that that God is giving to Daniel. Listen, don't disconnect verses 24 through 27 from this heartfelt prayer where Daniel is pouring himself out saying, God, you have been faithful. Will you please continue to be? Daniel comes to, sorry, Gabriel comes to bring hope and encouragement. We have to find hope and encouragement in this or we're not making sense of it. It's also important for us to remember that apocalyptic literature can be transtemporal, which means it, it's outside of time, and so it can mean it can be fulfilled multiple times, right? It could have been fulfilled with Antiochus, who sacrificed a pig in the temple. It could have been fulfilled in Christ in his crucifixion. It could be fulfilled in his return. Then it can have multiple fulfillments. But I, what I want us to do, and where I want us to focus, is look back to verse 24. Because if we're not careful, we start to go, what are these 77s, right? And that's where our focus is. But, but don't miss what follows the 77s. The 70 weeks, the 77s are decreed about your people in your holy city. And people stop there. But listen to what Gabriel says. Why? There's six things. To finish the transgression. To put an end to sin. To atone for iniquity. To bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and prophet, and to anoint a most holy place. What does that sound like? Jesus. Like that Jesus steps in to do what? To put an end to transgression, to atone for sin, to bring in everlasting righteousness. To seal means like to be the God's final word of both vision and prophet, to anoint a holy place. Listen, Gabriel is telling Daniel, who's looking into the future, saying, salvation is coming. Salvation is coming. So Daniel's going, God, are you going to keep your word? Are you going to restore us? Right? And, and Gabriel comes in and says, salvation is coming. What you're longing for, what you're hoping for is coming. It's further removed than you want it to be, but it's coming. And it's going to look different and better than you could have even imagined. Salvation is coming. Because what happened at the end of Daniel 8 after that vision? Do you remember Daniel's emotional response? He was freaked out, appalled, and in bed, going, I don't understand what's taking place. Do you notice in Daniel 9, there's no fear? There's no like emotional response. Why? Because God is saying, You're safe and you're secure with me, and salvation is coming, and you can trust that. Listen, it continues by saying, Know therefore and understand, right, that from going out of the word, right, to restore and build Jerusalem. So Jerusalem was restored. The temple was rebuilt. And then it says for 62 weeks it will be built again with squares and both, but in a troubled time. There was difficulty for, for Jerusalem from here on. And then it comes into the last, the last, the 70th seven. And he says, 
and an anointed one will be cut off from heaven. It's Jesus. It's, it's the crucifixion. Isaiah 53 8 says that he will be cut off. That this one will come and he will be cut off and will have nothing. So what is the desolation that Daniel 9 is talking about? It is that Jesus, the Son of God, is crucified. That, that the, the world would crucify him. And then in 70 AD, the temple is destroyed once and for all and is down to this day. A covenant with many for one week and for half of it, he will put an end to sacrifice offering. What did Jesus do in his death? He was the final sacrifice. Offerings and sacrifices are out. He has done it. And so basically what Daniel is being told is there's going to be salvation coming, and we know that we're living in the 70th seven. But just like last week, the last days are more of a phrase to say it is a period of history. It's not how quick or brief it's going to be. And so, yes, we're in the 70th seventh. We're in the last days, but the last days have been going since the life, death, resurrection, ascension of Jesus, and the leaving of the Holy Spirit for 2,000 years. And so in this, Daniel is finding hope and peace and encouragement that God will keep his word and be faithful to it. So what do we do with Daniel 9? Here's where I want us to end this morning. Daniel is praying to God who is sovereign and in control. And I think there's a temptation to us to go, hey, if God is sovereign, if he's in control, what do my prayers have to do with anything? And yet what is Daniel doing? He's saying... God, I know you're in control because you've let Babylon fall and you've raised up the Persians, and I'm still coming to you. Listen, what we should see in this is that God is big. He is not small. And if he's raising up nations and destroying nations, right, if he's taking the exiles back home and re removing the captives, why are we not praying these sort of prayers for one another? That God can raise up that God can release the captivity of sin. That he can make you and from being an exile of this world to at home, right, as a son or a daughter of the king around the table. Why are we not looking around going, this God who is in control of history? Yes, I'm praying for you. We're not praying little prayers, we're praying big prayers. Because God is able. Would we be bolstered and encouraged and reminded of that this morning? Daniel is praying scripture, right? He's reading through scripture. Scripture drives him to praise God and then to begin to ask things of God. Why? Because it allows him to see himself right and to see God right. He's confessing, God, we have sinned against you. I see my sin. I see my need. Rightly, scripture reveals that. And it also tells me how glorious and great you are. And so we see him praising God. And owning his sin and going, by your righteousness, not mine. By your mercy, not by mine. By your deeds, not by mine. It's allowing him to see the world, God himself, right. So that he begins to trust the faithfulness and the character of God. Listen, he's putting his confidence in the attributes and the promises and the character of God. That he is loved, as Gabriel tells him, you're greatly loved. But he's saying, God, you, right, you're faithful. He looks back and goes, you were faithful to move us out of Egypt. You've told us that you'll take us out of Babylon. And salvation is coming. He's seen that, that God is faithful in the past. And because he's faithful in the past, he's faithful today. And I can have hope that he's going to be faithful in the future. It's the same for us that our confidence is. Right? So we look back and say God has been true to his word. And not only are we looking back on Daniel, are we looking back on Egypt, we get to look back at the cross. Say God has kept his word. And if he's kept his word then, that means he's going to keep his word now, even if I can't see how he's going to do it. And it means he's going to keep his word in the future. He is putting us on stable, steady ground once again. Not because of our merit, but because of Christ's righteousness. He's removing fear. Listen, Daniel doesn't get all the understanding that he would want. 
And what is, what's he being told? You're safe in my hands. And so when we begin to go to scripture, we, we say, God, you've promised that even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, walk, you are with me. Although you, I will have trouble in this world, I can take heart. Why? Because you've overcome. Right? We begin to say, he will never leave me. He will never forsake me. And I have access. And we begin to take the promises of Scripture, the attributes of God, and they begin to give us steady ground to stand on. Because we go, you have been faithful. You are faithful. And you will be faithful. And so do we get to know all the all the things we want to know about death? No. Do we get to know all the things we want to know about heaven? No. Do we get to know all the things we want to know about the end and how that's going to come and exactly when and who's going to do that? No. What do we know? That we are secure in God's body. Not because of our might or our merit or our efforts, but because of His faithful mercy, forgiveness, and righteousness. So we say with Daniel, Right? As he's looking on God, you have been faithful. We get to say Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Because he has been the sacrifice in our place. And so Daniel goes to the Lord in prayer, trusting that God wants to hear from him. Church, would you be reminded this morning, first Corinthians, or sorry, first Peter 5? Cast your cares and your anxieties upon the Lord. Why? Because he cares. So you can take your doubts, your fears, your worries, your concerns to him. And as a good father, he goes, I want to hear from you. I want to hear from you. I want to meet you in this. I want to put you on steady, stable ground. That is Jesus the rock. And if Jesus is the one who was made, who knew no sin was made sin, as 2 Corinthians 5 tells us. And so how do we know that we are greatly loved like Daniel? That the one who knew no sin became sin so that you could be called the son or daughter of the king. Romans 5 8 tells us that God demonstrated his love for us, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Like if you're wondering, well Daniel was special, he was unique. No. Jesus says you're loved. And he has not just said it, he has revealed it, he has shown it, and he has placed us on solid ground. Listen, if you are carrying an open shame, as we see in 7 and 8. That open shame can be removed by Jesus. Not because you deserve it, but because He is good, and He is righteous, and He is merciful, and He is forgiving. Salvation has come. Jesus has put an end to sin. He has atoned for iniquity. He has brought in everlasting righteousness. He is the God's final word, and He was anointed in a holy place. It is done. Salvation is here. And as we turn and pray and ask God to keep us until that last day, would we know that we're also interceded by Jesus? Listen to Hebrews 7, 25. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Jesus is interceding on your behalf. He says this as well in Romans chapter 8, verse 34. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, the one who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Which goes into the famous passage then of what can separate us from the love of God? The answer being nothing. So this morning, as you picture Daniel looking out his window towards Jerusalem, asking God, God, be faithful, be who you said you would be, be the promise keeper that you are, that you can pray with that boldness and that confidence because Jesus is at the right hand of the Father this morning, interceding on your behalf, having left the Holy Spirit to seal and to keep you as a down payment until the end of time where we will be with him forever. You are loved far more than you know. Church, you are loved far more than you know. And it has been demonstrated. Salvation is here and it's Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your 
faithfulness to speak. And Father, would we not be so confused or befuddled or wanting to spend a lifetime so in the weeds of nuance of, of apocalyptic literature that we miss the hope and the joy and the peace and the certainty and the solid ground that you were giving Daniel. God, would we know that as the world rages around us, as, as the ground seems to crumble around us, that you have placed us on solid ground. And that we are kept, not by our might or merit, but by yours. So Lord, would we look back with gratitude, would we trust and depend upon you today, and would we look forward with hope, because we trust you. That you are consistent in your good. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, as, as the band comes, we're going to sing to our King, who's receiving our praise today. I mean, there'll be some men and women in the back. If you need someone to talk to or to pray with, and then the Lord's Supper is also set up in three stations around the room that you can get up and take at any point. As we remember that it is not our righteousness, but it's Christ. It was His body broken. It was His blood spilled. That we can taste and see that He is good. That His mercy is for us, and that we belong. Would we respond as the Spirit leads us? Stand and sit with us this morning as we respond.
Lord, help us to follow David's example here. 